welcome everybody back to the next session of Eco Aesthetics. My name is uh, Anna Priedola and I'm working at Lepaja University. And in this session, we will move from uh, the perspective of other species to human point of view on uh, nature and ecology and how it impacts uh, the environment. The first speaker will be Sandra Alvaro, who works in the intersection of art, philosophy, and technology. She develops a theory grounded in practice of the mapping of conceptual frameworks, which improve our understanding of the current socio-technological system and its relations with the Anthropocene. Among the, her research main areas are aesthetics and politics of computational technologies, epistemology of data-driven models, collaborative design, and the emergence of new communities of practice. The Commons and Environmental Justice, New Materialism, and Posthumanist Philosophy. Sandra Alvaro holds a PhD in philosophy from the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. She has been uh, a research fellow of the program of culture analytics at the Institute of Pure and Applied Mathematics at the University of California, Los Angeles, and an invited artist researcher at the Laboratory Photograph uh, Situ at the University Paris. Eight. Nowadays, she is adjunct professor of contemporary art in the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. Please, Sandra. Thank you, Anna. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk here and enjoying so many uh, interesting projects. I will start with my presentation. Sorry. It is here. I will start telling that Isabel Stengers asserted in 2009 that we are living in catastrophic times. What is interesting about her diagnostic is that it links the environmental crisis with the depletion of all social and cultural systems and the impossibility of sustaining a capitalistic way of life. Of life. In this situation, uh, nowadays, we assist to the proliferation of contradictory messages for example, we are compelled to continuous consumption to sustain our economic system at the same time that we are alerted to control our carbon footprint. These contradictory messages causes cold panic and a passive reaction conducting to anxiety and the conviction that the game is done and there is nothing we can do for a resurgent world. Here, or in view of this situation, Stengers proposes Gaia as an intrusion. The exhaustion of our environment forces us to face our barbaric times in a pragmatic manner. By means of the critical review of the complex relations involved in this situation and the starting of a process of multifold creation, a compositionist and behavior aimed to reconstruct and create new relations with the environment and all its agencies that can be able to nurture new forms of holding. The cosmopolitical proposal by Stengers consists of the consideration of the environment and the complex entanglements producing it as a matter of politics and the fostering of creative action towards the proposal of alternative patterns of life. Ecoaesthetics uh, can be defined, this is a possible definition, as a new technological, technologically mediated vision from where our environment appears as a complex network of systems and process networked at different scales. Ecoaesthetics is not something new. Uh, we have early examples in the 60s, uh, for example, uh, with the system aesthetics proposed by Jack Borham and from where Hans Heck works are an example. For example, condensation cube is a quite effective way to show uh, natural processes uh, going around us perpetually and that we, we have not direct perception. Uh, in a more 
activist way, the work of measures uh, proposes autodestructive art as a way to show the potential of an, for annihilation of the industrial society. What has changed now is that as our technology has become environmental and networks of sensors populate our environment, while our capacities to collect, analyze, and process this data increases, ecosthetics beneficiates of new possibilities linked to the multiple ways in which data could be generated, translated, and transcoded. After the encounter with computational technologies and natural sciences, ecosthetics puts art in the core of the cosmopolitical project. Art, can, art projects can increase the perception of our environment, can track the natural cultures, what is to say, the social and cultural formations sustained and interlaced with the environment, and the networks of living organisms that accordingly to Lee Margulis interact to produce the biosphere. At this way, art could contribute to the regeneration of the imagined natural cultures and the proposal of new entanglements for the recovery of our environment. Art becomes at the core of a change as the projects about the environment assembled different concepts that has been emerging after postmodernity from the encounter of critical epistemologies, processual monist ontology, relational ethics, and the radical evolutionary theory by Lynn Margulis. And they contribute to the definition of cosmopolitics. At this way, art participates in a progression from biopolitics, as it was defined by Foucault, that is, the use of the capacities for simulation and prediction of technology to exercise preventive control over humans as a species and their environment that are assembled in a statistical mass, to a cosmopolitics in which data is not only aimed to prediction, but also to storytelling and increased awareness. And technology is not aimed to control but to mediate in the composition of the habitable world. The statistical mass is substituted by the diversity and evolution of symbiosis and preventive control gives place to ideas as the recovery of the commons, the ethics of care and environmental justice. In the last years, we are assisting to an explosion of artistic projects that relates to the environment and the anthropocene. To quote some examples, we have the last edition of Ars Electronica, where there is a lot of projects about environment, uh, the Riggs Festival and the exhibition we have here, the Kodat exhibition, uh, the Ecovisionaris exhibition that has been held at different locations, including Spain, Portugal, and England, uh, the critical zones, held at CKM, after the end of the world that was held in Barcelona in 2018, and Future Life that is held this year at Laboral that is also in Spain. Analyzing the projects presented in these events, we, can, we could identify some structuring concepts and processes. Uh, I will show here some projects that, um, that map the hair beyond the planetary view, and and produce more than human entanglements. Uh, others that were in speculative fiction in two different senses as a, gen, as a form of geoengineering and also as a, as a form of compositionist storytelling. And finally, uh, collaborative, collaborative projects aimed to increase our awareness about the environment and change our behavior. Mapping the hair the beyond the planetary view uh, consists in changing the way we represent the world. The planetary view is produced by satellite, by satellite image, image and the proposal of the microscope to visualize and study ecosystems. This planetary view positions humans in front of global phenomena 
that are the result of an accurate process of classification, simplification, and simulation, in which the analyzed event is isolated of all the complex relations and agencies that produces it, an event that suffer from its evolution. One example is the, the, the prediction of climate change map that is produced by NASA. I made that prediction, a prediction, uh, this Images appear as completely detached of our agency. They become paralyzing screens in front of which we could, we could only become helpless spectators of our programmed decadence. Opposite, there are emerging new proposals for imagining the complex phenomena occurring in the habitable surface of the planet from a local perspective grounded on Earth. Here, epistemology is not the reductionist view I meant to prevention and control, but a deeper view able to discover differences, emerging behaviors, and unexpected associations, which could inspire new practices and more equitable and sustainable forms of relationships with the environment. Uh, the proposal by Bruno Latour for considering the Earth as a complex network of critical zones is an example. But in the artistic field, uh, we find projects as the atmospheric forest that, that has been presented here and uh, everybody knows well. And in this project, the world to visualize data does not project a big screen obfuscating the materiality and complexity of living phenomena but offers an immersive experience that invites to perceive the complex relations between the climate change, the forest, and the atmosphere. And it shows that as an aesthetic experience that we can, we can live. And we can feel that being part of. In this line, we encounter other projects, for example, Adriatic Garden, that has been presented in the last edition of Ars Electronica, is also a project, uh, is, is also the result of collaboration of artists in a long lasting scientific project. In this case, the Aqua Forensic. This project analyzes data from two sure locations, Dubrovnik and Cook to study the invisible chemical pollutants in the water environment. In this case, the information is experienced using sound uh, and taking the form of son the sono-adriatic tales. Besides, uh, this project also includes citizen science. At this way, it engages the locals in the process of gaining awareness of their environment in addition of a series of events that involves transdisciplinary research about anthroposocio-technological relationships with the sea. And this, this, uh, this research can be useful for reconstructing the complex nature cultures that grows around the, this ecosystem. For example, the relations to study the relations between polluan industries and the traditional economies related to fishing that now are in danger of, of extinction due to this, this pollution. Another resource, uh, another, another project um, related to that is this the intimate earthquake. Uh, but this is quite interesting because it used a database of seismic mujer movements and the tush that are produced by fracking and that is a quite aggressive form of extractivism and, and translates this seismic, the data of these seismic movements to vibrations into these jackets in a way that the people that are wearing it can feel the effects of this extractivism uh, practice in their bodies. Another way of process uh, is speculative fiction. Uh, speculative fiction is a design and behavior. I'm to project dystopian scenarios and technological interventions 
for the survival after the depletion of the natural environment. And this project, uh, the mitigation of shock by the studio Superflux, is an example of one of these scenarios. It reproduces or plants an uh, apartment uh, as a closed system, completely monitored and self-sustainable for make possible living in the London of the 2050. Another example of this way of proceeding uh, are some words by the study of Thomas Saraceno that study animal behavior and alternative source of energy for allowing human being, beings to conquer new habitats. Uh, for example, to, to live in the air but with the project Aerosene or underwater uh, with this project that White Mates is just a study the strategies of a kind of a spider that envelops herself in, an, in a kind of bubble, um, oxygen bubble, uh, allowing this animal to live underwater. However, speculative fiction, as defined by Stengers and put in practice by Donna Haraway in Staying with the Trouble, could be also a keen originative storytelling. Data Garden, that is another project that we have been presented here, uh, can be interpreted as a, this kind of compositionist practice in which the possibility of avoiding data surveillance by storing information in a local plan becomes a restorative practice for engaging local citizens in the care of their environment. Uh, we have also projects like Scavengers by Krista Sommer and Laura Mignon that use um, artificial intelligence in this case to um, speculate uh, or to reproduce uh, the actions of some autotrophs organisms, in this case, bugs, uh, can be also bacteria, and how they can collaborate with us in the recovery of the environment and just consuming or waste, 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 sorry, or waste, and, and producing organic matter, uh, this way contributing to the regeneration of or the maggot environment. And I think I am in time and, and there is any questions <laughs> and thank you for listening. I'm now just now on. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra, again for um, uh, drawing out the framework framework of uh, eco aesthetics that we will um, delve into more in this session. Um, my question to you is: uh, How do you think this uh, availability to technology and uh, data visualization? doesn't it uh, give maybe false utopian um, optimism that we can control and really understand what's uh, going on currently with the ecology? And uh, how would you say, what is the current attitude of artists? Is it optimistic or pessimist about uh, ecology and eco ecosystems around us? Currently, <laughs> this is a really interesting question and, and quite uh, long and complex. Uh, first, um, technology. Um, uh, there is people that is really pessimistic about technology that is becoming part of, of the destruction of our environment. But there is people that thinks it can be also part of the solution. Uh, technology can be used also in a constructive manner. Um, for example, uh, these artistic projects are, can be an example of you know, how technology can help us to understand what is going on around us and that we some phenomena that the action of bacteria or living organisms or, or how industries pollute the atmosphere and what are the real effects of this pollution and that we cannot perceive uh, even now without the help of technology. Then this is one part, just increasing our awareness of what is going on and, and 
be able to perceive uh, in an augmented way, we can say, or environment. But another part is just to help us, uh, working as a mediation, to help us to envision uh, other, other assemblages, you know, how to relate with technology in a different manner. You know? we, have been, we have seen here some projects um, I don't I do not quote it here because this is not the space, but we have seen here some projects that uh, plan different kinds of cooperation with with living organisms, uh, really small living organisms you know, that that a way to that a way to 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 have new opportunities or new ways to inhabit it, inhabiting our world. Uh, this kind of cooperations, uh, are interesting in in a pragmatic way that can possibly can make possible our other ways of living in our world, but also in an ethical and political way that they um, they establish new ways of relation with the environment and 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 help us of taking care of our environment, not like somebody that is just surveying and have a dominion over the environment, but this just collaborating with it, you know, that is, um, I think is a more interesting uh, approach. Not, not the anthropo, anthropo anthropocentric approach of thinking that the environment is there for us to take care of it or to exploit and to use, but that is something like is linked to us and our possibilities of being. And is another way to understand caring. Not just I care of you because you are my responsibility, but I care of you because you are my collaborator, you know, because we are engaged all together in that. And technology help us to understand this different kind of relation. And for me is what these projects are, are showing so well. Thank you. Thank you to you. For your research and um, yeah, drawing out these outlines of eco aesthetics. Our next uh, speaker is um, Ellen Rudd. Um, her speech is called Image as Sight, the Forest. Ellen operates as both a visual artist and educator and has been involved in questioning and exploring electronic and digital materialities and cultures for the past 25 years. Recently, her interest in the both formative networked aspects of media have developed towards a more specific focus on practices of field recording and how cameras, microphones, and similar devices enable forms of inquiry through ethical, technical, and aesthetic conditions in relation to the environment. She has completed a PhD equivalent fellowship in the Norwegian Fellowship Program for Artistic Research and is currently professor for the profile area Art, Technology, Materiality at Stockholm University of the Arts, where she leads a PhD program in artistic research. Please, Ellen, we are anticipating. Mm -hmm. Peter is going to present the film. I had some problems with my internet connection, so we pre-recorded it. I will be here. Hello. Thank you for being here. I am an artist working with moving images. I am deeply indebted to artists such as Mary Lucier, Stana Masulka and Nancy Holt who, once video cameras became available to them, developed their practices in terms of elaborate investigations of the relations between their cameras, their bodies and images generated by these devices of and in the world. For these pioneers, objects were considered active and co-creating rather than discovered or revealed. Video was approached as bundles of material, cultural, social conditions occurring as a form of ecology, generating insight through their ability to enable particular kinds of networks, and even more important, as a practice of inquiry. The work of these artists created fields of attention between, and they experimented with ways of building worlds through modulating these fields. 
the attraction of video art as a mode of inquiry is amplified by its resistance to be treated as a medium or an art form or even a specific practice. In its various artistic forms, it can be performative, essayistic, cinematic, social. Video is everywhere, performed by everyone. Also, video happens in the now. It creates senses, material and temporal experience in an ecological way. It constitutes a remarkable mode of conducting artistic research by enabling an ongoing inquiry obtained through a wave-like field of interaction and negotiation weaving into another, modulating attention in a reflexive way in relation to images. The most fundamental relation of moving images is their relationship to the human body in terms of vision. This is where the experience of movement is created. In technical terms, we speak of groups of pixels renewed at a certain rate, or more traditionally, frames per second. Anything less than 25 images or frames per second will be experienced as jittery or not moving at all, more like a sequence of still images. Clearly, in the virtual social here that we currently constantly find ourselves in, the most important set of material conditions is the bandwidth of all our internet connections. As a result, the images that I am showing you might appear as moving, or moving to a certain degree, or not moving at all. I would like to invite you to try to not be annoyed by that, but to rather pay attention and notice what these conditions produce in terms of your experience of this material. After all, these images are not artworks designed to be experienced in a certain way, but examples of my research material, generated as part of my practice as a means of enabling, paying attention to and noticing the, noticing the kinds of infrastructures that I am interested in. These images are recorded in different parts of an area of Sweden called Vestmanalam, the land of the Western men. As most of Sweden, this area mostly consists of industrial forest. A few small areas are protected by their owners for the sake of biological diversity, although in Sweden only a very small proportion of forests are protected with regards to biology. I find this somewhat surprising a Swedish forest policy was early in adopting ambitious goals for the conservation of biological diversity and other values that could be seen as additional to timber. A former global role model, Swedish forest policy is today largely about increasing the production of raw materials. The model for forest conservation is largely based on voluntariness, just as with most of the COVID-19 measures, which means that each landowner private, company or state sector 
as a voluntary responsibility for preserving the natural diversity of the forest. Forestry is the backbone of the Swedish economy and 58% of the land area is counted as productive forests in which mainly spruce and pines are farmed for industrial purposes. The industrial forest has been cultivated for centuries. Peter Larkin writes, know a plantation by what it does to plurals. In 2014, this area of Westmanaland saw the largest forest fire in Sweden in modern times. In the aftermath, the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency made agreements on land exchange with the private owners so that they could protect a portion of the burnt land in order to enable the development of a fire-affected forest ecosystem as these, as these are lacking in contemporary Sweden. I have been visiting the area on several occasions, engaging with various parts of the forest on different times of the year. In the footage you see, two cameras are mounted on a bar balancing on a stationary tripod. The cameras are set in a fixed relation to each other on a fulcrum that enables them to pivot and pan on the vertical and horizontal axis according to two factors operating in combination gravity and wind. When there is only very little wind, the camera remains silent, as in the first clip, where it eventually expanded the arc of vision in a slow sweeping pan, inviting a more circular view of the scene from its fixed center. Stronger winds push or pull on the cameras in a way that offsets the balance, thus creating pivoting as well as panning movements, partially echoing the circular panoramas of late 19th century cinema of attraction, as Tom Gunning has named the first decade of the history of cinema. A period when spectators went to the cinema not to take part for narrative, but to experience images of movement. Acknowledging its derivations from the panorama, the early use of the pan tended to pick up the locations familiar from American landscape painting and present them as vistas in panoramic movements. As Tom Gunning shows, most early film companies offered panoramic views of sites, both natural and man-made, sometimes modifying the term to circular panorama to indicate a sweeping view or even full 360 degrees views. When the winds are strong, a full 360 degree circular pan is sometimes obtained also with my rig, but never it seems in the burnt forest, where the scarcity is of a different kind and the movements of air are distributed in a much more diffracted way. In some way, it could perhaps seem as if the footage echoes the dehumanized landscape of Michael Snow. In the iconic work La Région Centrale from 1972, he left the camera to be moved by an automated device, 
which varies its complex patterns of movements according to programmed algorithmic parameters within a complex crane system. This was designed to free the eye from the condition of relative immobility and of dependence on coordinates, as Deleuze has articulated it in his analysis of Snow's film. La Région Centrale explores what some considers a dehumanized landscape, captured by automated devices and to a certain degree disconnected from human agency. My site, on the other hand, is deeply intertwined with human activity. Adjustments of various parameters, which I have called activities of tuning, of devices such as cameras and other instruments for capturing data, allow their users to engage with the world in a particular way through providing reference on one hand and performativity on the other. As such, in my practice, I try to consider image as a site in, in itself, enabled by the mesh of conditions it is part of. In the current setup, the cameras are afforded responsibility not only for registering the data, but also for adjusting focus. They do so according to the given spatial conditions, such as the current proximity to a tree, in combination with their material conditions, such as the sensitivity of their sensors, which again depends on or is modulated by aperture. Movement is controlled by the wind, modulated by gravity as well as by the forest itself while white balance, angle and aperture is negotiated by the camera operator, me, via a set of reflexive adjustments that I do manually with my hands prior to and between each particular take. During recording, I'm intensively engaged in noticing what is going on in the image, outside of the image, in the light, with the light, the wind, the sound, the life of the forest itself. I'm acutely aware of the impact my body has on the resulting images and sound, and I'm continually engaged in evaluating the image and sound that is currently being captured, while paying attention to every little disturbance. In this sense, I'm trying out thinking of image as a sight in itself, enabled by elements of performance, such as movement, body, transience. Also, I'm approaching the forest as a landscape, but also as an industrial site, or as a ruin of an industrial site. It's a kind of blasted landscape, its disturbances being a constant reminder of the mesh I find myself in through this approach to moving images as a form of field recording, a particular mode of camera work that is based on paying attention to the active connections the image forms relations between the body of the camera operator and the devices involved through the various processes of tuning. Field recording in itself is a methodology and a set of tools I am borrowing from sound art and from my collaborators Signe Lidean and Trud Lossius, with whom I am developing this practice as a form of embodied camera-based listening as a way of relating to the environment by paying attention and modulating parameters in reflexive relationships enabled by the image and all its entanglements. Hello, thank you for being here. Hello. Hello. Thank you, everybody. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I think it's been really interesting to take part in all the presentations today and somehow I think the curation is really elegant um, the way that the different talks connect to each other so thank you very much for that thank you Ellen I hope I'm hearable now <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ellen. Again, um, your uh, video totally drew me in. It was working as a site and it was very meditative experience and, uh, between uh, this um, conference. Um, and uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, how do you present uh, your work to the audience? And these uh, videos outside of Zoom, outside of... Uh, yeah. 
with the edge. This is certainly important for children, that's for sure. Now, I usually make installations. Uh, that's my main format, uh, video installations. Uh, but I don't know, somehow I'm, I'm almost less interested in the artistic output these days. Um, I think I'm more interested in just kind of continuing to work with the field work rather than creating art objects to exhibit. Um, it's a face, I think. But um, so these I haven't actually shown as artworks at all. Uh, I think it's actually the first time I show them that these images. It's it's really I really consider it as as material, not artworks, mm -hmm. at the moment at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I guess due to the time limits, we have to move forward. Uh, but if uh, anybody has any questions, please uh, ask them in the chat of uh, the Zoom conference. Thank you again, Ellen. Um, the next uh, speaker is Laura Belov, and Green Kitch is the theme she's uh, going to talk about. Uh, Laura Beloff is an internationally acclaimed artist and researcher in the cross-section of art, technology and science. Additionally to research papers, articles and book chapters, the outcome of the research is in a form of process-based installations, wearable artifacts and experiments with scientific methods that deal with the mer merger of the technological and biological matter at large. The research engaged with the areas such as human enhancement, biosemiotics, biological matter, artificial life, artificial intelligence, robotics and information technology in connection to art, humans and society. Currently, she is associate professor, uh, professor at, and the head of Vika program at Aalto University, Finland. Please, Laura, we are looking forward to your speech. Thanks. Do you see my screen and do you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's great. So my title is today Green Kid. So even many of you might know me also as an artist. I'm not going to talk about much of my own work today, but I will talk about the relation between kit and biological art. So if you think about it, at the first sight, it would seem obvious that the idea or aesthetics of kit and biological or natural environment are located opposite of each other. And this is exactly where my interest is located in this contradiction. So with the developed possibilities in today's biotechnology, we are able to design new organisms and modify existing ones, um, including their aesthetic looks. And this points to the question of design decisions and what kind of criteria is used in these decisions. So in this talk, it will be a look into kit, its politics and its relation to non-human world. So, uh -huh, wait, how do we go here? So what is kit? So this seemingly very simple question produces in most of us images of kitschy objects such as these frogs. And in the traditional uh, definition, kitsch is something that is considered a bad or poor taste, an artifact with sentimentality and with an ap appeal to popular rather than high class art or high class taste. And of course, the, the originating term comes from a German art markets from the um, 1860s and 1870s, and it described cheap, popular, and marketable pictures and sketches. However, the term itself has been then theorized a lot and beyond this 1816 or, um, 1860s or 70s into the deep history by, by many uh, scholars from starting in the 1930s. So, um, I have a colleague, Mats Ryunanen, um, in Aalto, and he has written a little bit about kit, and he has claimed that he can see two waves in the evolution of the kit's concept. In the first wave, he locates the classical texts on high and low culture, and they would go also the text of Clement Greenberg's famous essay, Avant-Garde and Kitsch from 1939. In the text, Greenberg locates Avant-Garde and Kitsch in opposite of each other, 
and states that kitsch is a product of industrialization, which urbanized the masses in the Western world. The second wave includes uh, texts such as Umberto Eco's text, The Structure of Bad Taste, and also texts by Kalinescu and Kulka. They are all from the 1980s. According to Ryynänen, in them, kitsch starts being visual culture and the balance between everyday culture and art starts being equal. So in his text, Umberto Eco writes that kitsch is a petit bourgeois phenomenon. In other words, there is a public that believes it can enjoy an original representation of the world when it can only appreciate a secondary imitation of the primary power of the images. So what also comes clear from this uh, division into two, two waves um, by Runanen is it's in, that kitsch has an inherent connection to the world of representation. Okay, so however today, I think one can also speculate if our perception of kitsch concept is in transition. And according to Max Rynan, and today's kitsch concept has been generalized closer to what we interpret as female culture with its, sentiment, with its sentimentality and cheesiness. And even more importantly, kitsch is no longer such a negative concept as it has been in the past as a kind of bad taste and, and low culture. Okay, so here's an... Um, I want to um, continue a little bit. There's a fantastic book, um, maybe in 99 or 2000, Babelist, where there. Celeste Ola, Olal Puyaka um, wrote a book uh, called The Artificial King Kingdom. And in it, uh, she talks about the sensibility, uh, which is based on the preeminence of looking and collecting. And this would also include the sort of a top taxidermy animals. According to Ola Kikuyaka, some of the produced commodities of the earlier times can impact a kit experience in us. Kits can be seen as a failed commodity that speaks of all it has ceased to be. Ola Kikuyaka writes, kit is a time capsule with a two-way ticket to the realm of myth, the collective or individual land of dreams. A lot of her research is focused on Victorian era, era, and what is interesting for me in her research is the focus on, on uh, nature and the imitation of nature. Uh, Olal Kuyaka claims that the Victorian era had an affection to imitation and disguise that was eventually blurring the limits between fantasy and reality. And of course, here you see some taxidermy uh, examples from the Victorian era. Um, in the next image, and this is, um, I have uh, shot this just with my phone. Um, what becomes clear, quickly clear when visiting such a museum as this Dublin's Museum of Natural History is that this is a human interpretation and organization of nature. One could easily see the historical display of the taxidermy animals as kitsch in their overly anthrop anthropomorphic gestures and expressions. There seems to be a desire to see species aesthetically captivating, cute, beautiful, or dangerous. And in a way, I think the museum in Dublin represents the history of collecting and displaying. Or as Giovanni Alloy has stated in relation to taxidermy, the practices of seeing and naming. Alloy writes in his book, Speculative Taxidermy, about the presence of taxidermy in contemporary art. According to him, it points directly to the tie between language and realistic representation, um, which um, questions uh, what is being seen as a very variable truth. And this leads me to the tension between the real and the fake. Um, and these are two strands I'm looking at. One is kind of at the moment, the displays and collecting, so-called seeing and naming. And the other one is biological um, cultiv cultivation 
and aesthetics with that. And I have written a little bit about them before, but to save time, I'm going to skip that and go straight into some of the examples I have here. And uh, here you see seeing and naming the history's cabinet of curiosities. Also, many drawings were made. And um, so I have, um, we have the long practice of seeing, naming, categorizing, and organizing of things. This is also about gaining control and power over the non human world. One can also point out the large part of the value in these things and animals is from the fact that they were once alive and have this tight connection to the living. Here's another uh, from the other strand, biological cultivation and aesthetics, the tulips in uh, Netherlands, which were getting stripes originally because of virus, later on they were cultivated looking similar as they came very uh, popular. Here's another one quite interesting, and this is of course 1938, a sort of a streamlined plant. And uh, for example, this potato, the new streamlined Chipeva potato, absence of deep ice reduces waste in peeling and also speed up the job for the housewives. Quite astonishing uh, symptoms for me. And uh, um, this, of course, has also the, the sort of, um, one could say, a dangerous uh, relation to eugenics. But that is not what I'm talking tomorrow uh, today about. Here are a few art examples in cultivation. Um, maybe this is called the first, um, first uh, experiment between genetic modification and art. Edward Steichen, who was a photographer, um, made uh, tests with chemical mutagen. So dipping, I think, the bulbs of these uh, plants into a, a chemistry which induced a chromosome doubling. And his plants came double the size compared to the, what it uh, used to be. And here they are in the Museum of Modern Art. Georg Gesset, many of you probably know his work from since the 1970s, he's been cultivating irises. Here's a quick reference to my own work uh, with the cloned Christmas trees. And um, I think Christmas tree is, for example, a prime example of cultivated and uh, cloned organisms in which aesthetics are the selection point. So one can, of course, obviously say that um, the or question if these are actually kitsch, these last examples, and maybe in today's standards they are not, but they do point towards this potentiality of modifying living organisms according to our tastes and selecting the aesthetics for them. So now, uh, very shortly at the end, a uh, little bit back to the tension between the real and the um, uh, sort of a living versus artificial fake or kitsch. Um, so living organisms are often display, displayed in biological art. They are not representations, but they are actual real living and biologically grown. Whereas in kitsch, in the past tradition, they are strongly, uh, it is strongly connected to representation as pointed out before. The question is, when the organisms are no longer grown, but designed by us, what kind of aesthetic choices will be made? And will some of them be, become or be kitsch? This tension between grown and real is uh, well presented in the works of this and the next artist. And here's a Jennifer Willett, um, which from its looks follows familiar aesthetics to the kitsch, the Great Lakes algae organ, bicycle propelled, street organ that grows and displays living spirulina algae. People were invited to crank the street organ and view the living samples of algae under the microscope. Willett Wright, the object imagines ecological and biotechnology research integrated into everyday life, life of the family and child life, including imagination and play. However, in a comparable manner, as previously pointed out with taxidermy animals, in the, um, the organisms are displayed in vitro, maybe in an ornamental style. They are seen and they are named, following the Giovanni Alloy seeing and naming. And through this act of seeing and naming, we impose certain type of control and power over the species. So what does this packaging of the work with kitsch aesthetics do to the work? 
Willett writes that the designed look challenges contemporary laboratory aesthetics, which emphasize sterile masculine dis laboratory design that generally conveys gendered or the or, uh, authoritarian Western hierarchy of knowledge. I think it does additionally, it brings forth this tension between the real biological grown organisms and artificial framing designed by a human, which in this case is following kids aesthetics. And um, hold on. Here's another work uh, quickly, and this is an older artist, uh, Aga Neta Duc, from Canada as well, as Villettis. And he's best known for these works for the honeybees. They began already late 80s. Uh, she rented beehives, and in the process, she called them also her collaborations. So she places objects into beehives and allows insects to build honeycomb on the objects, sometimes over the course of the years. So somehow there's a different sensibility, but at the same time, the tension between the real biological and artificial human constructed is present in these works as well as in Villette's work, and which both of them are emphasized by these kitsch aesthetics. So Celeste Olakuyaka has pointed out about the Victorian era affection for collecting natural matter, such as flowers, insects, shells, made relics out of things whose value emanated from their intrinsic relationship to life. One can continue and say that kitsch aesthetics in today's biological arts brings visibly forth the currently increasing tension between the real and artificial. And thank you. Thank you, Laura, for a very interesting presentation. Um, which reminded me that uh, in um, the era of enlightenment, um, gardening was considered one of the four uh, main art forms uh, besides uh, visual arts, music, and poetry. And uh, human, human uh, tendency to make uh, everything around them beautiful <laughs> and uh, comfortable is, uh, has a long uh, and uh, violent uh, roots. Um, <laughs> uh, what I wanted, um, yeah, to ask you is, um, how do you think uh, the society uh, um, currently um, uh, looks at these uh, kitsch object objects because in uh, media culture, not so much in the eco culture, the trash aesthetics are quite popular. Yeah, that's true. Uh, there's a trash aesthetics, but there's also, I think, a kind of kitsch trash aesthetics, and and I have this um, idea that somehow kitsch aesthetics are st sort of a coming back and I, for me, what is really interesting is that um, I think a lot of you know if one tells a story and you, you are somewhere in the landscape with a couple of friends and you look at the landscape and then you, oh, you can't take a photo because it would be just kitsch the photo. It's better to look at the landscape. So for some reason, there is this interesting tendency that um, these aesthetics are now adapted towards the nature. And that's also part of my, my curiosity in this, that how, how, where is that located? And when more and more we design not only gardens, like you mentioned, but we design also single organisms and in the future. So are we artists designing them? And what kind of aesthetics would we take? or is there going to be fashion? So these are very speculative questions. I don't know, let's see where this goes. And, and um, I should still mention that it's an interesting that I this time work this way, that I, at the moment, not working on a kitsch work, but it probably will come later, which sort of speculates. So I have started more kind of from a theoretical ground, and I would... Um, go with the Ellen with the same idea that at the moment. I'm just interested of in doing the field work and the research and the theoretical work and not so much of exhibiting. Even I do works. I just actually have a new work hanging just beside me here, but it's just 
somehow the interest is at the moment somewhere else. So thank you. Thank you, Laura, again for your uh, um, research and we look forward for the for the work in future. So our last um, speaker today is John Kessier um, with uh, presenting his uh, project Filthy Germinators. John is an American writer and designer. And primarily his work deals with ecological design and media. He has a bachelor's degree in graphic communication design from the University of Cincinnati, NMA in a design research writing and criticism from the School of Visual Arts in New York. His work regarding ecological design and the commodification of nature has appeared in such publications as the Buffer, Mold Magazine, Ega, the Eye of Design, and Core 77. John, we are looking forward for your presentation. Hi, thank you. Hello. Uh, okay. Let's see. So. Uh, I will be reading a short story I wrote, a shortened version of a short story I wrote, that is a fictional speculation on the present and future of urban ecological life. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Filthy germinators. When the oaks, the sweet gums, the cherries, the maples, and the chestnuts started to grow strong where the street once was, Pop began to complain about the air. Gets in my throat, he'd say. Tastes like dirt. Pop would say it was the spores or some little invisible critters coming out of the trees, but no doctor could ever explain what, what it was that was so distasteful to him. For Pop's entire life, the only air he had ever really known was filled with particulates, chemical fumes, exhaust, the sort of air that comes from a tailpipe. Clean air, air that was filled with life anyways, was invasive and wrong and so far as he was concerned. I'd rather breathe in something dead and artificial than something that squirms and wriggles and might even have a mind of its own, he'd growl, and then would proceed to spin some yarn about the sensory pleasures of gasoline, for which he seemed to have a genuine affection. And before the pandemic, Pop's feelings about the industrial air and the many engines that produced it were shared by the majority of the people in this city. But when the pandemic did strike, it had made air so long taken for granted a conduit of death. Life expectancy sharply declined, and after three years of suffering, the city could no longer deny the violence of the manufactured air and the ways in which it exasperated the virus. For me, barely an adult, the air I breathed became a constant reminder that the young were bound for a short and a brutal future, if there was to be a future at all. For once the right to health was lost, and even the right to air that wouldn't kill you, then what else is there? It was, all, it was amid all of this hopelessness that the germinators arrived in the city, not grandly nor quickly, but slowly they emerged from the cracks in the pavement. They weren't popular in the beginning, and even today, a decade on, the germinators continue to be criticized by the nation's leading industrialists. We once lived in an era of engineering marvels, they'd say. Elevated road systems, 16 lanes wide, skyscrapers, and all manner of mega projects that elevated this country above God himself. We had made the earth better for us. And now we've traded it all for what? A light touch and an android gardener? Needless to say, Pop concurs. The nostalgia for the age of industrial America is well disseminated and he's happy to jump on board any campaign to undermine the presence of the germinators. In fact, he still sends me emails with articles about the allegedly sinister programs that have been coded into their systems. You really think they're just there to watch over the birds and the flowers? Come on now, be real. The city wouldn't let them hang around if it wasn't giving them more power somehow. But the germinators are hardly androids. Most 21st century kitchen appliances have a more sophisticated brain than the germinators do, which are more akin to a basic calculator or even an abacus. The germinators are actually pretty stupid. The city couldn't afford the rare earth elements required to make them smart, that's for sure. 
but their basic OS is part of their brilliance. Germinators, for purely functional reasons, are more like trees and fungi in their thinking, and less like any animal thinker. If you have one germinator, it won't do much. It would be like a tree planted alone on an island, surrounded by concrete with roads on all sides. Its life would be brief and sickly. Yet as a system of growers that communicate with one another, the germinators thrive. Most of the data they store is not kept long term, typically held, holding it on, on to it about holding on to information about the species growing in their region for no longer than the four season cycle. They mostly operate upon signals that they send to each other through their shared network. The germinators signal to each other about the climate, earth conditions, moisture levels, population sizes, and other anomalies that may impact the many species in their little localities. They don't even have a camera only a primitive light sensor. And plus, they're off a lot of the time, running off of only a little bit of solar power that they rarely need to store. Which isn't to say they're perfect. They break down, get confused. Sometimes there are chaotic factors that harm the environment where they work, but luckily they are incredibly resilient, easy to repair, and there are a whole lot of us people around to help them out if necessary. It is still a city after all. And while we all continue to suffer the brutal residual infrastructures of the early 21st century, the living beings in collaboration with the germinators are slowly beginning to dismantle that city that was once so well designed to snuff out the potential for life. But there's a long way to go still. They're filthy and eyesore. Pop would whine whenever I took them out for a walk around the block. Look, you wanna grow more flowers or whatever, fine. I don't care. But can't they make the germs look nice at least? Make them shine like a car, you know? Cars are beautiful. Sure, you use them to get around, but they have a look, a character. They shine, have a bright, solid, metallic color. These germs, they're all different and weird looking. They're made of that weird, gooey, organic bullshit. They're all different shapes. They look like they've been vandalized, he'd say. And while I can't speak to his tone or his taste, his description of the germinators isn't too far off. The germinators are all different, and while Pop suggests this robs them of character, I'd say it endows them with it. They do tend to have some dirt on them. The aesthetic of the germinator was and remains a contentious issue. Many, many people were, wanted the germinators to be uniform, sleek, clean, shiny, with a nice reflective glass surface and a screen interface on them like our phones and refrigerators and cars, of course. This was fraught from the beginning, though. For firstly, it was always understood that the germinators would be working in the earth, on the ground, outside, and animals would be crawling on them, and they would be rained on, shit on, and get covered in pollen and fungi. Making them sleek and giving them a screen would require extensive regular cleaning, and there was little interest in subsidizing uh, such services. The calls for uniform modernist aesthetics were overruled by suggestions from the local city planners that the that the neighborhoods should decide on the aesthetic for their ger local germinators. Built with an easily moldable, moldable biomaterial, the appearance of the germinators could easily be customized. Sibley said, people make them their own, even if the germinators were all uniform in their initial designs. Some neighborhoods with high property values did try to make them sleek and modern and kept them very cl clean to try and keep the aesthetic of new land developments. But most neighborhoods chose to make their germinators completely unique in appearance. Some appear like uncanny scarecrows. While anthropomorphizing has generally been discouraged, the scarecrow germinator gives the kind of association of an agrarian community that many seem to like. But honest, and honestly, it is likely the closest thing to pastoral life that exists anymore. But they are not human size. They are scarecrows that stand as tall as a fully grown Labrador. It is also popular to shape the germinators into animals. On Pop Street, they've made the germinator into a little lion that they call Don Fabrizio. On other streets, you may see a monkey or an octopus or even a dinosaur or a mammoth. There are no bounds to the form they may take. And yes, they tend to be a bit filthy, but what do you expect? There are a lot of germinators in the city now, but hardly enough to care for how massive the city has sprawled out to be. The patchwork of living and brutally lifeless neighborhoods 
has made the city Frankenstein-esque, a body that is only partially reanimated with life and tries it might fails to find some ecological harmony. The city is better, but only just, as species continue to disappear and, ver and various quarters of the city become less and less habitable. What we have now is what we needed the city to be 20 or 30 years ago. The pandemic that had spurred the implementation of Germinators initially is not fully gone still, even after a decade. While they have long been vaccine, there's long been a vaccine, access to it is not comprehensive enough to stamp it out completely. And there are still large portions of the city where air quality is unhealthy, if not dangerous. Luckily, Pop's neighborhood is one well managed by a germinator, though we would never say as much. Many of Pop's neighbors work in the urban meadows, collecting crops, feeding the plants, maintaining the neighborhood, and helping out the germinators. Nobody is obliged to work in the meadow but that were once streets, but nobody is barred from it either. While they are not in every neighborhood yet, the germinators have already become so much a part of the fabric of the city. And by now, they are all so different, have so much taken on unique forms that match their neighborhood, that even calling them all germinators feels a bit strange. Just like our Don Fabrizio, they have developed names and identity that make them unique, yet they are all interdependent, all shifting around the same energy between the many busy life forms that surround them. Pop appears much older now than when this all started. Germinator or not, life amid compounding crises takes its toll. He remains stubborn. He will never go into what he still calls a street. He still complains all the time about the germinators, about the messy and ugly looking gardens that fill the street out of, outside of his house. Despite this, he spends a lot of his time on his front stoop now in an old lawn chair. He insists that the absence of loud road construction and the smell of garbage that used to dominate the neighborhood was preferable. It's too quiet now, he says. The, no the noise was soothing, and this is creepy. It makes me uncomfortable, he says as he looks disdainfully down at Don Fabrizio, who prowls contentedly around a vine of grapes at the base of Pop's stoop. Thank you. For the poetic uh, end of this uh, panel, um, it seems a bit in, uh, inappropriate to ask questions about uh, a story. Maybe who is the who is the narrat narrator? Who is the storyteller? Uh. I didn't have really anybody in mind specifically. I suppose someone who is uh, of a younger generation in this current time, you know, today. Thank you again, John. And uh, if others have questions, please uh, be welcome to, to put them on the chat. And with this, uh, we conclude uh, this session. And we will be back uh, after five minutes with the next session, Atmospheric Experience. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>